Right. Good morning, everybody. We're live here. I am at the Birdhouse, and today I'm joined by our special guest, Scott Feibush. Um, if you are anywhere in the Rochester area or Western New York area, area, you probably know that on Monday, April 8th, it's coming up very soon, uh, between two around 2 and 4.30, the Rochester area will find itself in the path of totality for the solar eclipse with totality occurring around 3.20 p.m., I believe, right around then. Mm -hmm. um, that totality will last for about three minutes, 38 seconds, give or take, depending on where you are. And Rochester is one of only a few communities in New York that will be in this path. So it's a really special event. It is quite rare. And we've uh, if you've been a customer at the store, you know that we've been preparing for it with our eclipse glasses. We have telescopes now, and a lot of you guys have had questions, and would love to know if you have any questions. As always, you can throw those in the comments. Um, Scott knows a lot about eclipses. He is the man, and um, he this isn't his first eclipse either, so I um, really want to hear about his experience and why this is such a special event, and um, we're really excited so welcome scott thank you for being here today thanks so happy to be here to join you this is this is so exciting it's it's starting to feel real now you know we're uh we're what nine days away and we can start even seeing some early weather forecasts that look tentatively promising it's too soon to know for sure but uh yeah we are we are in for the big show and this yeah. is pretty rare so how i guess the a good way to start off how rare is totality i mean we've been we've seen partial eclipses here before but not full totality probably in a really long time there is nobody alive at this point who really remembers the last time that we had a total solar eclipse over greater rochester it was 1925 so you know anybody now would be over 100 who would have been there that day and on top of it if you look at the newspapers from that day uh it was cloudy in rochester <laughs> <laughs> so there really aren't a lot of people who can say that they remember totality here. Uh, the next one that will come over Rochester, I guarantee you none of us will be around for because it it'll be 2144. Okay. Uh, the next one anywhere in the continental U.S. Uh, is going to be in 2044 in about 20 years, and you'll have to go up to North Dakota for it. So these are not super common events at any one location. Overall, they happen about once every year and a half or so somewhere in the world. But that involves a lot of traveling if you're really serious and, and you want to get to some. You know, the next one after this is 2026 over Iceland. Wow. Okay. Gotcha. Which would be pretty cool, to be honest. Yeah. I, yeah. Now, but, now are you, would you consider yourself an eclipse chaser? I have been fascinated by this. You know, I remember the, the last total solar eclipse that came over the continental U.S. before the one seven years ago uh, was in 1979. And I was in second grade. Um, you know, I knew we weren't going to have totality here in Rochester. That was mostly a West Coast event over Oregon and Washington. Um, but I had made the little pinhole viewer in school out of the shoebox and mm -hmm. gotten my second grade class all excited. And then it was completely clouded in that day, too. And I had this date that was marked on my calendar. Yeah. You know, for all these years, that's at August of 2017 is when the next one is coming. It was a really long gap, yeah. um, you know, and I want to get there. And uh, so in August of 2017, we, we loaded up the family on a Sunday afternoon and we drove from Rochester all the way to Marion, Kentucky, which is about a 12 hour drive, give or take. It's a little town in western Kentucky. Um, and, you know, we got to Total the night before, we got a few hours of sleep, we got positioned in the town park, and we saw Totality. Wow. And as much as I knew about intellectually, oh, okay, it's going to be interesting. You know, I'd seen partial eclipses, and okay, the sun gets partially covered by the moon, and then all of a sudden it gets covered completely. And it literally, you know, the temperature dropped, it was a really hot day. Um, it was close to 90 degrees that day, and it was humid, and the temperature dropped, the humidity dropped, the the sun was just a black hole in the sky. I mean, the picture that you see behind you is more or less, um, you know, maybe a slightly enhanced vision of, of what you may see here, but you see that corona of the sun, those, those tendrils that you see coming out that are always there. We just never get to see them because the sun itself is so much brighter. 
Uh, you see stars during the day. Uh, you hear the birds reacting to it. Now, do not do not ask me which birds <laughs> were reacting because I know a lot about eclipses and very little about birds. I'll, I'll put that right up front there. Um, but you definitely, you know, you hear wildlife reacting. It's just, it's the most dramatic change you can have in just a few minutes. Uh, and then in this case, two and a half minutes later, it was all over and we were right back to daylight and, and humidity and sunshine. Wow. Okay. That's, that's wild. So yeah, that's uh, what a lot of people have been wondering, you know, what, what happens? Do the birds just stop chirping? The insects just stop, you know, making their little sounds. And it sounds like that's the case. It basically turns into night yeah, very quickly, I mean, very dramatically. They get, I, I would imagine it's got to be very confusing if you, you know, if you yeah. don't know that it's coming, um, you know, and I would assume that the birds probably are not listening to public radio and, and listening to our series here about what's coming up. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, all of a sudden it's dark for them and they react as they would when it's dark. I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see what my dog does with it um, Yeah, yeah. and, and how she handles it. Uh, one piece of advice that, that came out pretty early, I'm on the Rochester Eclipse Task Force. And one of the questions that came up was, okay, everybody's got their eclipse glasses and that's great. Do you need them for your pets? And the answer is no, you don't need them for your pets because your pets in a lot of ways are smarter than we are. They don't look up at the sun. Yeah. <laughs> but they are or not. And so you're not going to need to stick these um, on your dog, your cat, your parakeet, whatever. They're not going to be looking up and, and getting their eyes damaged. Yeah. So that's that was another thing I wanted to touch on, too, is that you do need the proper eyewear for the events because regular sunglasses won't do the trick just like in your day-to-day -day, even if you've got your sunglasses on you can't still you can't stare at the sun wearing those and we've also heard too um you could maybe speak to this that even with your eclipse glasses that you shouldn't stare at the sun for more than about three minutes at once is that is that right yeah i mean i wouldn't i certainly wouldn't recommend that and the thing to remember there are a couple of points here um, you know, a couple of things you want to look for on eclipse glasses. So these are the official Rochester Museum and Science Center version. Um, they still have plenty of them available there. What you really want to look at, let's see if we can get a close up there, mm -hmm. that, that ISO symbol um, that tells you that they're ISO certified. And then it says right here, ISO 12315 mm -hmm. uh, or 12312, ISO 12312. You really want to make sure they have that. There are, unfortunately, especially if you go like on Amazon or whatever to get your glasses, there are people who are selling shady, no pun intended, eclipse glasses out there. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid those. Make sure you get the good ones. Um, you, can you can check them out ahead of time. I mean, if the sun is out, like I'm looking out the window here, the sun is sort of out right now. You can put your eclipse glasses on now. And if they're working right, the only thing that you will see when you're looking through them will be when you actually look up at the sun because everything else is so much dimmer. Um, so if you take your eclipse glasses and you look at, let's say, a bright light bulb in your house, with good eclipse glasses, you will not see any of the light from that light bulb. With bad ones or with your sunglasses, you will, and then you know you want to avoid those. Put them away. If they are at all scratched or bent or damaged, get rid of them and get a new pair. Okay because those scratches can let too much in. The other really important thing is to know when to have them on and when to take them off. Okay. Because the whole time that you are in partiality, so from you know 2.07 in the afternoon when partiality begins for us, right up until totality at about 3.13, you need to have these on. As long as even a smidge of the sun is visible around the moon you want to have these on. And you won't be staring at the sun for three minutes at a time because this all happens very slowly. You know, if you look up at, let's say, 2.15 or 2.30, and you look through the eclipse glasses, what you will see will be most of the disk of the sun with just a little tiny bite taken out of it. And then check again a few minutes later, and you'll see more of it. Check again a few minutes later, you'll see even more of that. If you just sit there and you keep them on, it's going to be pretty boring after a while, and you're already doing damage to your eyes. Once you get to totality, that's when the show really begins, because as soon as the disk of the moon completely covers the sun and the last of that bright part of the sun goes away, you want to take your glasses off right away, because otherwise you will see nothing, and you will uh -huh. miss out on the whole show. 
and I want to emphasize this because people get confused. It is safe once you are in totality and only once you're in totality to look directly at where the sun would be. And that's the real cool stuff. You want to do it right away because you get what are called Bailey's beads and a diamond ring effect around the edge of the sun, around the edge of the moon, rather, because the moon, of course, is not a perfect circle, right? It's got mountains on it. And so as those mountains come across the edge of the sun, it doesn't cover the entire edge perfectly circularly. And you get these bright little beads. And if conditions are just right, the last thing that you get before the sun kind of winks out is this one very bright, they call the diamond ring, um, where you just see this one burst of light. And you don't want to miss that. That is really, really neat to see. And then you have about three and a half minutes during which all of these conditions change. And during which you want to have the glasses off, you want to look up at the sun, but you also want to be looking down and around. And I think this is especially important for this audience because, you know, birders are accustomed to doing that, noticing the natural world around them and processing what the sounds are, what the smells are, are like. And an eclipse gives you a feast for all of these senses. It's not just visual. And so you will hear all kinds of sounds around you. Uh, you know, depending on where you are, if you're in a big crowd, if you're up at Cobbs Hill, if you're at the ballpark, at the museum, you'll hear a lot of people cheering and shouting and crying. If you're somewhere that's a little bit quieter, if you're out in your yard, you know, take these moments of quiet because you will never have this experience again in your lifetime without really working at it. And then as soon as the totality is over, as soon as those three minutes and 38 seconds are done, as soon as the tiniest bit of light starts peeking out again from around the moon, have your glasses ready, get them back on again, because after that, you then cannot look at the sun safely again. I didn't think about that, about how uh, the landscape of the moon can affect how it looks. I never even thought about that. That's a really good point. That's really neat. Um, and it's, it's really, and, and, and this is something that I talk about a little bit in the series that I'm doing here at WXXI, is that you know, the fact that we get these at all, you know, never mind every hundred years or whatever, the fact that we get these at all is just an absolutely remarkable piece of cosmic engineering because the sun is about 400 times the size of the moon. Mm -hmm. And it is also about 400 times farther away than the moon is. And it is only because of that, that they line up perfectly in this way that it becomes this perfect circle around the sun without just blotting out all of it or without just covering part of it. It depends on where we are in the orbits of the sun and the moon and the earth so that if the moon is a little more distant from the sun, there are times where it would be a total eclipse, except the moon's a little smaller in the sky at that point mm -hmm. because it's farther away, I should say, from the earth after the sun. And so you get what's called an annular eclipse where you get a ring of fire that surrounds the sun for the or that surrounds the moon for the entire time, and you can never take off the glasses. You don't get the full totality. That happened. Um, people who were out west in in uh, September of last year, or October rather, got the chance to see one of those. Um, but the fact that just you know these these happen to line up at exactly the right size, we are kind of unique, uh, at least in the solar system, for having that. You could go to Mars and see a total solar eclipse. But it would be a little dot of their tiny little moon crossing across the face of the sun. And you would not be as excited. Also, I believe there would be no birds there. Not to my knowledge, no. <laughs> um, so as far as viewing, I think it's also important to say you shouldn't use any kind of binoculars or telescopes unless they have the proper solar filters on there, right? We've, we've been getting questions about that, about viewing it. Uh, with binoculars, even in totality, you probably shouldn't be looking through binoculars. In totality, you're okay through binoculars uh, you and you're okay through okay. telescopes. But right up until that moment, you know, think about it now. And, and same thing also if you're if you're looking through the viewfinder of an SLR camera, mm -hmm. same deal with that. Because if you are looking through it before totality, you know, now it's actually amplifying the light of the sun uh, into your eyes, and it's going to do even more of a number on your corneas. So yes, you absolutely want filters. Um, those filters are available. I wouldn't wait if you're looking to get them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I haven't checked like at, uh, at Scott's photo, for instance, to see what might be left over there, but I know they went pretty quickly in 2017. 
Um, do not just think that you can take, you know, a sheet of regular mylar or something and put it over your binocular lenses, or your telescope lenses. It will not be good enough. Um, don't, don't even try, you know, some people say, well, can I take a picture with my cell phone by putting this, the solar glasses over them? Not really, because yeah. you run the risk of getting just enough light leakage through the side of it. Um, they do make filters that are specifically for cell phone lenses, and you can get pictures that way if you're so inclined. Again, you take the filter off when you get to totality, um, so you can get the spectacular pictures in totality. But the truth of the matter, too, is that unless you are setting yourself up, you know, way ahead of time and you really know what you're doing to get a perfect eclipse picture, don't focus on taking those pictures of the sun. Everybody will have good ones that you can look at later. Get the pictures that you'll never be able to get again of the people around you reacting, of nature reacting, of what it looks like on the ground, um, of what the birds are doing. Uh, and and document them and and see what they're up to too. That's that's valuable documentation. And you know that what I look back on the most from our experience in, in Kentucky, I set up a video camera on the uh, hood of my car, didn't point it at the sun at all, um, because again, you can also damage the sensors of a, of a camera that way um, without the right filters. I just pointed it at our family and the crowds around us uh, as the eclipse came, and it's amazing. And and I can show you that video. Yeah. of what it looked like as it got dark, as people started reacting, as everybody started jumping up and down. Uh, it was it was really something. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Um, and there's also going to be a comet visible, right, during the um, during that moment of totality where everything is black. Yeah. yeah. So we've, we've got all kinds of great stuff happening <laughs> in the sky. It's um, there is there is a comet that is out there. And if you go on any a uh, decent astronomy site, sky and telescope, or what have you, they can show you exactly what to look for there. Um, seven planets are all going to be visible lined up in the daytime sky um, if you know where to look with the sun blotted out. And this is, you know, this is not extraordinary at nighttime. You can actually go out at night over the next few weeks on a clear night, and you can see that too. Sometimes during the during the day when Jupiter or Venus are close and are super bright. You can see them in daylight, but this is different because now you're actually able to see all of, excuse me, all of these at three thirty in the afternoon. Uh, and when do you ever get a chance to do that again, right? Yeah, that's wild. So it sounds like you do have you've got video of your experience, yeah. your last eclipse experience when you yeah. went to Kentucky. Would love to see that. Yeah, Marion, Kentucky. Yeah. Let me uh, yeah. if you can. Okay. Let me share my screen here. I can bring that up. And I've, if um, if people do have glasses left over from that eclipse in 2017, are those still okay to use or should they get new ones? That's another question. Better probably. The, the official word on these, and actually they say somewhere on here, oh, this one doesn't. Generally, the official, official word from the people who regulate these uh, is that after about three years, you don't know for sure that the mylar hasn't degraded depending on where they've been stored. Mm -hmm. um, so it's better to get new ones if they are clean, if they are not scratched, if you have stored them in a safe place all these years. And I actually had a pair from 2017 that were just sitting in the glove compartment of my car for about five or six years till I finally got rid of that car. Um, you could probably use them again. These are not expensive to get, and they are very widely available. Most of your local libraries um, have these for free, especially this coming week. They're available. I know the city libraries starting Monday are going to have glasses available for free at most of their locations. Um, Rochester Museum and Science Center is always a reliable source. Uh, Wegmans, I know, has them, and you have them at the Birdhouse, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, go to the Birdhouse. Yeah. Buy new glass. <laughs> we also have actually those the kits to um, I don't know if you can see it my, with my snazzy filter on here. Um, but these are the kits that you can put on your cell phone camera. It's like a larger uh, mylar that'll go over the, the cell phone camera if you do want to take a picture. Yep. Uh, but we do have those too, which have been those have been really popular. Oh yeah, and again the same you know same rules apply that if you keep that on past the moment of totality. Mm -hmm. you will be taking a lot of very black pictures of nothing. <laughs> That's good to know. Okay. And yeah. so you definitely want to take it off right at the moment of totality. 
and then kind of keep tabs. You know, if you're in a group, have somebody time out three minutes and 38 seconds mm -hmm. so that you know, okay, we're near the end of this now. Uh, and you better get ready to put that filter back on. Um, but also the same thing can happen at the end of an eclipse that can happen at the beginning of an eclipse, because again, you've got the mountains on the edge of the moon that are uneven. And so as those make contact again and pull away from the edge of the sun's disk, you can get the Bailey's beads strung out along the edge. You can get the diamond ring effect. And that's super cool to look at too. Just be very ready immediately. Get those back on and don't damage your eyes the second that the, that the sun actually pops back out. And our, um, so we're going to have totality for the three minutes, 38 seconds. Is it about the same everywhere in the country or does that vary as well? It varies. So there is a path, you know, what, what you're really seeing, if you want to think about it this way, is you're seeing the shadow of the moon passing over the earth. And if you were to look at it from an airplane and if you go to nationaleclipse.com.org, national eclipse anyway, um, they have some wonderful animations um, that they've done that literally show where this shadow is and how fast it races across the surface of the earth. So when it comes over us, it's going about 2,500 miles per hour. So Buffalo gets it a few seconds before we do. Syracuse gets it a few seconds after. It goes up into the Adirondacks. But the length of time depends on exactly where you are because it depends on how close you are to the center line of that shadow. So the center line of that shadow happens to pass through northwestern Monroe County before it goes out over Lake Ontario. If you are in Brockport uh, in particular, if you are in Hilton, um, you will have the absolute maximum amount of totality that you can get in New York State, which is about three minutes and 43, 44 seconds. Um, downtown Rochester gets about 338. And then the farther you get towards the edge of that band of totality, the less totality you have. So if you're in Canandaigua, I think you get about 35 seconds. If you're in Rome, you get about 35 seconds. If you get south and east beyond that line of totality, it's a very, very solid line, and you are either in it for a moment or you're out of it completely. And the difference between being in it for even a moment and out of it completely is kind of the difference between wow, this was an experience that can change my life. And yeah, that was an interesting science lesson. <laughs> gotcha. Another another way that it's been described at some of the Eclipse Committee meetings that I've been to is it's like driving your kids 99% of the way to the gate of Disney, of, of Disney World and then turning around and going home. <laughs> yeah, you got 99% of the way there, kids. <laughs> yeah, okay, but. <laughs> and there are places where this really matters um, in San Antonio. Uh, the line of totality crosses right over the middle of the city of San Antonio. And if you go for all of the normal, you know, exciting tourist destinations in San Antonio, if you think you're going to watch it from the Alamo, if you think you're going to watch it mm -hmm. from the Riverwalk, you're in 99.58% totality. And you may as well be in zero because you're never going to be able to take off the glasses. It's never going to get super dark. You won't see the corona. You won't see Bailey's beads. You won't see the seven planets lined up or the comet or any of that. You drive 10 miles up to the other side of the city or up into the hill country and you get more. Same deal in the Finger Lakes. If you are in Ithaca, if you're in Watkins Glen, Binghamton, Elmira, you don't get any of it. You've got to get at least to Geneva, to Canandaigua, even a little north of Penny Ann would be not bad spots. But the closer you can get to that center line of totality, the longer you get to experience it. Wow. Yeah. So the, the location really, really does matter. And you, so you said the one in Kentucky you went to, was that two minutes something? That's about two and a half minutes. Okay. Um, you know, and it depends too. This is another, you know, little bit of, of celestial ge uh, geometry is it depends where we are in our orbit. So it depends how close the moon is to the earth and how large it is you know appearing in the sky that affects how long you're in totality it affects how long or how large the band of totality is so it was narrower in this case um and so it was shorter there are spots in the u.s that will get a little more than we get so there are places if you get down into oklahoma and texas uh that will get over four minutes mm. 
uh, in 27 or 2027, um, there is going to be an eclipse that is going to go over Egypt. It will be total over the Sphinx. It will be total over the pyramids for over six minutes. Wow. And there are already, I was looking actually, there are travel yeah. packages. People are selling these nine day packages to go look at it. It's three years away. A lot of them are already sold out. Wow. Are you gonna go? I don't know yet. I would love Ooh. to. I would love to get there. I mean, that would be talk about a, a really neat experience. Um, I see Linda's question there yeah. um, about seeing the two faint globes of light. Um, there really, there shouldn't. Well, you know, I'm saying that I'm looking at my certified glasses here and we have very bright halogen lights uh, that are up on the ceiling of the studio. And I can see just a little bit of the filament there. And these are approved glasses. So if your lights are really bright um, and you just see like a little bit of the filament of the light um, or the LEDs, you're probably OK. Um, you know, if you look up and you see the entire light fixture, I would get better glasses. But you, know, you really want to look particularly for that ISO certification and that 12312 number there, um, because more than anything, that'll tell you that you're using approved glasses. A lot of the glasses for sale um, all come from a few of the same vendors. Uh, so these guys in California, they're called Rainbow Symphony. Their glasses are known to be good. Um, there are a few other vendors that are making ones that are known to be good. Perfect. Yeah. So it's important then if you if you still have your glasses in a package or anything, open them up, make sure they've got that little symbol on it that says ISO certified. That's yeah. a good and get them get them ready too. You know, that you have you can actually bend them most of these in a couple of different places. So depending on how large your head is, you may want them either wider or narrower. And you want to make sure that they're going to fit decently because you'll have them on and off for a little while. You know, there's there's give or take an hour and, and 20 minutes or so of partiality before. Um, there's also another hour and 20 minutes of partiality after. Uh, mm -hmm. And so don't go running out. You know, even even if you have traveled somewhere else to watch that day, avoid the traffic for a little bit. Sit and watch things return to normalcy. And until about I think it's 430 or so in the afternoon, 440. With the glasses on, you'll be able to see basically the reverse of what you saw going in, where more and more of the sun becomes visible as less and less of the moon is covering it until you get to that moment where the moon has completely ceased to cover it at all and, and normality uh, begins to get restored. Um, and otherwise, you're going to be sitting in traffic for an hour or two anyways. So. Yeah, that's the other thing. It sounds yeah. like that with they're expecting is it still estimated about a half a million people to come into Rochester, the yeah, Rochester so, area about? So we had a, a task force meeting. The last big meeting of the greater Rochester task force uh, was on Thursday over at RMSC. And I talked to the uh, head of the Genesee transportation council. They don't know for sure. You know, you never know for sure because so much it depends on people making last minute decisions. So much depends on what the weather looks like here versus other places that day. But if you are coming from New York City, if you're coming from Philadelphia, if you're coming from a lot of chunks of New England, we are the closest place where you can see that much totality. Mm -hmm. And so the expectation is a lot of people who want to see what this is like will be making decisions even as late as the morning of to say, oh, it's a six hour drive, I could get there. Well, it's not gonna be a six hour drive that day. It's gonna be a longer drive, yeah. but they'll be trying to get here. People here will be moving around, trying to get to locations, um, you know, whether it's the party across the street from us here at the, at the ballpark, which is gonna be pretty awesome. Uh, whether it's the party at the RMSC, I live down the street from Cobbs Hill. And I'm sure Monroe Avenue is just going to be jammed that day with people trying to get up there. But the good news is, you know, over the course of the next week, take a look up at the sun uh, in the late afternoon, about 3.30 in the afternoon. Look at where it is. See if you can see it. <coughs> and if you can see it clearly, if it's not a cloudy day, that's what your view is going to be mm -hmm. on Monday the 8th, give or take. So I know from my backyard that I have a couple of trees that will obstruct the views from some spots, but I have plenty of places where all the people who are descending on my house that weekend yeah. <laughs> can, all, can all spread out and get a decent view of it. Um, 
try to avoid if you have street lights in your neighborhood like i do um, get on the other side of the house from them if you can because they're likely to come on and spoil a little bit of the darkness um, when i was at the eclipse conference in texas last year there was one guy who was demonstrating a contraption he had built with a drone where basically he could direct the drone to take this giant lampshade <laughs> i kid you not and he would fly it up over a street light and drop oh. the shade over the street light <laughs> <laughs> just before the moment oh, of totality funny. i am tempted to do that in my neighborhood <laughs> um so you want to, if you have lights on your house mm -hmm. that are set to come on at darkness unplug those or turn those off if you can motion sensor lights um you'll want to turn off because it never gets to pitch darkness it's not like being out in the middle of the night um but it definitely gets darker um, and you want to be able to appreciate as much of that darkness uh, as you can. And I, I see Lynn has a question there. And then if you want to see the video, I can show you a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, Lynn that has a question here about um, yeah. using a colander. She says, we used a colander at the last one to see the design on the ground. Will it, it work with this one? It will. So this is, this is a cool thing to do um, during that hour and change while you are awaiting totality. Um, because even if you don't have eclipse glasses handy, anything with small holes in it um, will actually project the shape of the sun. Now, you can do this on any day. You can go outside on any day with a colander when it's sunny, and you point the colander up towards the sun, and you look, and you'll see circular little suns on the ground. Mm -hmm. Interesting science lesson. Sure. If you do this when the sun is suddenly a crescent in the sky... Those crescents are what get projected, and the thinner the crescent is, the closer you get to totality, and the smaller the holes are in whatever you're using, the more of these little crescents will project onto the sun or onto a piece of paper. Um, you can use a colander. You can poke little pinholes in a box. You can use a Ritz cracker. <laughs> Oh, yeah, somebody, yeah, someone yeah. said that uh, yeah. the other week, and I thought that was funny. I never thought about that. <laughs> sure, you can use any cracker that's got little holes, and if you if you angle it just right so that the sun is shining through those holes, and you look down at whatever it's aiming at, you will see the little crescents, and they'll get thinner and thinner and thinner. Uh, and none of this will work during totality because it's dark. There's no light at that point that's going to really refract through your colander or, or through your viewing box, but... Um, yeah, it's a great way to share that. If you if you have kids, what you can do, another neat project you can do, take a big piece of paper and you can actually aim the colander at different stages towards totality and have them trace the crescents as they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you have a nice little permanent drawing of the eclipse uh, that you can keep with all your other memorabilia. Uh, and hopefully, you know, our kids... I, I grew up, as I mentioned, a terrible generation to go see total eclipses. There was nothing in the U.S. between 1979 and 2017. Our kids are going to be much more lucky for this because there's totality in Alaska in 2033, in North Dakota in 2044, and then a couple of big ones come after that. Uh, there's one that goes over Texas and Florida in 2045, and there's another one that goes over Florida uh, in 2040, I'm sorry, 2044, and then 2045 is when it goes over a lot of Florida. 2052, there's going to be another one, and this time you could drive your kids to the gates of Disney World because it will go over Disney World. Oh, how fun! In 2052, okay. I bet that's already sold out. Oh, probably, yeah, seriously. Uh, and then, like for my kids, I'm not going to be here in 2079. Uh, I'm telling my kids, be in New York City when you're in your mid 70s in 2079 because there will be totality over New York City. Wild. in 79 cool. and what a sight that would be to see right mm -hmm. that's cool an update on linda's glasses she says they she does see the iso Excellent. symbol so she's she's all set there with her glasses Hi, and uh matt liked the story it looks like here about um the drone yeah <laughs> so yeah, people, your drone. people will really be doing I've, you know i've been contemplating i live in the part of brighton that has the old-fashioned street lights with the screw-in bulbs and I keep looking and thinking, how tall a ladder would I need that morning? <laughs> just the one or two nearest to my house. Just <laughs> unscrew them a little, put them back in when it's all over. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah the darker, the darker though. you can yeah. get, the more, you know, the other thing to think about is, and, and you can plot this out over the course of this next week. If you have days that have sunshine, look around three in the afternoon from wherever you're thinking of watching it. 
um, and see how much of the of the horizon you can see because the other neat thing that happens during a total eclipse when it's clear you know we're accustomed to what it looks like normally when the sun sets right you get gorgeous colors but you get them in just the direction where the sun is setting and everything around you just goes dark in a total eclipse because it's actually all happening up and higher up in the sky you get what look like sunset colors at the horizon but they're happening 360 degrees around you it's an absolutely wild effect and if you are up for example on a higher hilltop um, or if you're able to get like to the roof of a tall building something like that you can look around you can see that um, if you're up on a really tall building or mountaintop you can see the shadow kind of passing beneath you um, this eclipse goes over a big chunk of the adirondacks and for people who have the skills because it's not going to be great hiking weather yet it's mud season up there mm -hmm. but for people who have the skills to get up into the adirondacks and to get to some of those mountain peaks that day and just stay there and wait that's going to be phenomenal to see that happen all around you um, i have a cousin who lives up in saranac lake he's taking his boat out onto the lake that day and so he'll get that horizon effect around him on his boat so you have some time you've got nine days you can scout out um, you know, some of these places, you know, maybe there's some place very near your home where you can be. Um, you want to try to avoid the traffic as much as you can. Obviously, if you're already in the path of totality, let the show come to you as much as possible, but also be aware, um, you know, of the locations within that where you're going to get the most spectacular view out of it. How wild. So, uh, yeah, that, and that's kind of speaks to what you were saying before, where it's, there's going to be a lot of photos of of the actual event but all those other things happening around should be documented as well so that's yeah. that speaks to that yeah there is actually there is a, a documentary project um, where they are gathering um, people's videos and pictures from that day um, and they're going to put a lot of them into some sort of a documentary from all over the country um, so we can see what that experience looks like. You know, I'd love to be there. Are so many places in town where I would love to be yeah. all at once to see it because I'd love to be at the ballpark. I'd love to be at the museum. I'd love to be on Cobbs Hill all at once, and you only get one shot at it from wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how many events that are happening all um, throughout next weekend and through uh, through the, the full eclipse. There's probably hundreds of things easily that are going oh, yeah. on. So there's right, definitely there lots to choose from. The Rochester Eclipse 2024 website has a whole list of them. One of my favorites, the uh, Blue Heron Alpaca Farm, mm -hmm. um, is actually doing alpaca clips. Oh, yeah, yeah. I complete, that. Complete with t-shirts. They have the t-shirts. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. Make sure to get your uh, your Eclipse merchandise. Yeah, for and, the... and, it, and as far as we know, the alpacas also will not look up at the sun during the event. They don't need the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Special classes on <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, if any of you on have any questions for Scott, um, throw those in the comments. And mm -hmm. let's see um, some video. I got that cute. Yeah, well, that's that. a great way to kind of wrap it up. Give us a little taste okay. of what we'll see here in a little over a week. Sure thing. Let's uh, if you can share my screen here. Do I do that at my end or do you do that at yours? Do that on your end. Where am I looking here? Um, down at the. Oh, present. There we go. Mm -hmm. I see it there. Perfect. Share screen. Okay. Second. Oh, I see. I got to start that. Going. No media player. Ooh, technology is fun. All righty. I don't think I can share the audio from this, but I'll try. Okay. Yeah, I see it on here. There we go. All righty. So this is this is the view. So have you always been into astronomy and everything, or? Oh yeah, no. I go I go way back on this to when I was a kid. Um, I was always fascinated by it. Here we go. There's the moment I think where totality itself actually hits. That's my my son was nine at the time. He's 15 now. So I love to show him this. <laughs> That's so cute. And he gets to see himself bouncing around. And then you can see some of them still have their glasses off. I have to remind my daughter to take her glasses off. 
And it's actually, if I kind of fast forward this, you get the experience of somebody had fireworks off in the distance. <laughs> and then you can watch how quickly it gets bright again. So here we are at the end of it. And boom, just like that, it's back wow. to daylight. So this is the moment here. You can see where it, uh... yep. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard um, sometimes the crowd responses are just as good as, uh, maybe not just as good as the event itself, but it's it's going to oh, be it's, interesting to hear everybody's experiences and where they went and, and how it was and everything. Absolutely. And, and the truth of the matter is you don't know until it happens what your reaction is going to be. I didn't know. Yeah. I had no way of knowing until it happened, you know, just how moving it could be. So people scream, people laugh, people cry, people go completely dead silent. Um, one thing that I that I tell people to do is even, you know, just open an audio recorder on your phone and just just capture the audio of it. And those memories are so neat. Um, you know, set your phone up on a stand and, and point it at you because those are really the, the kind of memories that a lot of people don't capture. Uh, and that someday, especially if your kids are in it, they could be in New York City in 2079 with their kids and grandkids and saying, hey, take a look. This was what it was like for me. 55 years ago when this came over Rochester. That's wild. Are you a there Rochester uh, native? I am. I grew up oh, in Brighton, nice. lived in Boston for a while. Oh, another good question there in the chat mm -hmm. uh, from Lynn about do red and green change color during totality? Yes. Yes, they do. So one of the neatest pieces of advice that I just picked up uh, actually this week, um, wear bright colors that day. Tell, you know, if you're going to be with, with family or friends, tell them to wear bright colors that day because it's just like at twilight. You know, at twilight, your perception of colors change, too. Uh, and so look around at what people around you are wearing. And if they're wearing bright colored clothing, all of a sudden that will pop in different ways. The trees will pop in different ways. Again, I would not pretend to be an expert bird watcher, but I would imagine that it probably would make certain birds suddenly more visible cardinals are the red ones yeah. right so mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 you got it um you know it may it may very well make them easier to see if uh, if you're into that and there are so many hobbies i mean it, it's not just bird watching um that gets a chance to try different stuff one of my other hobbies i'm a, a broadcast engineer uh, and i do what's called dxing which is picking up uh distant radio stations at night and so on am radio you know how sometimes if you're tuning around at night um, you can get stations from much farther away. Well, that happens because when the sun goes away at night, um, the sun has been charging up this layer of the ionosphere um, that becomes uncharged at night. And so radio signals can reflect. Well, guess what? That happens during a total eclipse, too. Mm -hmm. And so some people who are, um, you know, really dedicated radio listeners may have AM radios out um, just before, just after, during. And for those few minutes, the AM radio band behaves a little bit more like it's night. And all of a sudden, you can hear signals from different places that you couldn't hear. So there are a lot of hobbies yeah. um, that kind of all play into this. You can you can be an Eclipse geek in so many wonderful ways. <laughs> How interesting. Yeah, that's really neat. How cool. Uh, Stephanie says, fascinating. It is yeah, fascinating. It is. It's amazing. That's you cool. know, for all of the, you know, we're in Rochester, people... People have a tendency here to get cynical about things and to be complaining, oh, it's going to be cloudy. Yeah. Enjoy this for what it is. You know, you have no control <laughs> over what the earth and the moon and the sun are going to be doing that day. You have no control over what half a million other people are going to be doing that day. But you can decide whether or not you want to really appreciate it and soak in the magic of it. It's going to be coming over you one way or the other. So you may as well is, is, is the way I see it, um, yeah. you know. Learn, yeah. learn, learn what you can. Enjoy what you can. Find the right spot, which is any place that you can see it, mm -hmm. um, and and get a kick out of it. Because even if it is cloudy or partially cloudy, it's still going to be an experience. You'll still experience oh, yeah. the whole darkness and everything. So it's not like you'll miss the event, even if it is happening no. to be a cloudy yeah. day. And we are. And again, I'm being, you know, knock on, knock on wood behind yeah. me here. I'm being very cautiously optimistic here. The forecasts right now, even if they are not sure about cloud cover, mm -hmm. all seem to be dialing into a fairly good certainty that we are not going to get heavy rain. And that's fantastic because if you get super heavy rain, 
you know, you know how it is here on a super overcast rainy day. You don't even know the sun's up there. Yeah. And so it going away, you know, it'll get a little darker, it'll get a little lighter again. If you have a day that's partially cloudy, you're going to be fine. You will still get so much of that experience because even if the clouds are directly over the sun, if you have clear patches in the sky, those will get dark. The temperature will still go down. They're saying right now, again, fingers crossed, knock on wood, they're talking about maybe high 50s, low 60s, maybe a week out for that. If that holds, that's so much better than being 40s right now, because it means, you know, we're Rochesterians, we can be out there in short sleeves <laughs> and then feel it drop for a few minutes uh, and come back. Um, but, you know, plan on where we are, plan on, on staying where you are, have some food ready for dinner. If you've got people coming from out of town, and I have at this point, I don't even know how many um, coming from at least three different locations who are all camping out on my floor. Uh, for the weekend um, and, you know, have them stick around. There's stuff happening in town that night. There's the festival all weekend at RMSC. And by the way, a quick plug, I'm also a stand-up comic oh. in case the bad bird jokes didn't tip you off to that. Um, and as part of the RMSC's Eclipse Festival uh, on Saturday afternoon, the 6th at, I believe, 345, um, my wife and I are hosting a show called... Uh, Totality funny, what we laugh about in the shadows. Uh, that will be free in the auto, in the Eisenhower Auditorium over at RMSC. They have a fantastic astronomer earlier in the afternoon, a guy named Phil Plate, uh, who blogs as the bad astronomer. He's going to be in town. And if you think some of the facts that I've shared with you are cool, wait till you hear him. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got live music. And that's just one of the things, Ganondagon, um, which again is a great spot up on a hill. Um, it has stuff going on all over the place. A lot of the towns are doing things. Um, you know, just, just don't sit inside. Don't miss it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're getting some. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Stephanie says, a half a million visitors are hoping for a sunny day here. Very true. Um, Lori says, so informative. Exciting. And Ed saying, maybe we should call them pre-post eclipse glasses since we'll not be wearing them during totality. That is, that is, <laughs> that is a good point. Oh, one more thing about these two is that after the eclipse is over, um, not the next day, please not the next day because they will be very closed and very exhausted. Um, but my <laughs> friends over at the planetarium, uh, Dan Schneiderman and his crew there, um, will be announcing uh, collections for used eclipse oh. glasses. Uh -huh. And they will actually be collected and sorted, and the ones that are still good will be sent off to other parts of the world for the next few eclipses um, so that they can be used there. Because Ed's point is absolutely right. They are important during total eclipses. They are even more important during partial eclipses. And so, you know, any time that it's not totality, then these really are eclipse glasses and not just pre and post. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. How cool. Well, it looks like that was everybody's comments and questions. I want to thank you so much for joining us. That was, this was really wonderful. We're really excited. And how how lucky that you just happen to be a Rochesterian who will be here I'm for so, I'm the, so thrilled oh, that you asked me. I wave, I wave yeah. every time I drive by your store. I'll stop. Oh, yes, uh, please do. Let's stop And it. say hi. And one more, one more plug also. Yeah. If you go to WXXINews.org or the WXXI Instagram page, uh, the first three parts of my series on what to expect when you're expecting a clips are up there and you get some nice little four minute um, audio pieces that fill you in a little more um, on what it feels like. Uh, there's one up there right now about the difference between totality and not totality. And uh, there's one coming next week about how to experience it with your kids and what to do if you really are determined to drive somewhere else. And then the finale Coming up next weekend will be exactly three minutes and 38 seconds about here are all the things you might want to think about during totality. How cool. Yeah. Oh, I see one more question there, too. Thank you. And what about contacts? Yes. So for, for those of us with visual aids, no, keep them on because otherwise you will see a blurry sun. <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, you want to you want to maintain your sharp vision. It is perfectly fine to put them on over your prescription lenses or to okay. put them on over your contacts. Um, if you do that and you're looking up for a long time at the really bright sun, you can kind of do this a little bit to minimize the amount of sun 
um, that's getting in around them. There are also, I don't know if they're for sale locally anywhere here, but there are plastic vision, uh, versions that kind of look like what you get after cataract surgery um, that cover uh, up a little more of your about. eyes. Yeah. We've, we've got a few more coming in, I think, um, this next week. Yeah, so, those yeah, those, more those those yes, keep, well. keep your glasses on because you don't want to have this experience be all blurry for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you want to make there sure you, you can see it. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for tuning in and thank you, Scott, again. And we will keep our fingers crossed for a nice yes. sunny day. And, um, and yeah, we'll definitely have to tune in and listen to your eclipse show. It's called What to Expect When... What to Expect When You're Expecting an Eclipse. Love that. And so, yeah, yeah we've got all the, the first three segments are all up on the website here at WXXINews.org. Uh, there's a video version on our Instagram. Perfect. Um, and on my Instagram, which is just at Fibush. Um, and Monday afternoon at one right here in this studio on Connections and WXXI. Um, I'll be in here with Evan Dawson and some of our other local Eclipse planners. Uh, so if people have more questions, you can hit us up then too. Awesome. Awesome. We're very excited. And uh, we'll tune in for that show. And yeah, thank you again. And thank you everybody for tuning in. And we'll, uh, we'll be back. The Birdhouse will be back on Tuesday with another live broadcast. And until then, everybody have a good weekend. We do still have plenty of glasses and um, solar snap kits, which are the things you can put over your cell phone. We have plenty of those in stock. If you are looking for those, we've got them. It sounds like the RMSC has a bunch of glasses as well as libraries and um, places all over town. So make sure that you are well stocked with your glasses and uh, we will talk to you guys all soon. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye-bye.